Okay, can you, can you hear me? Try that again. Is that better? Is that might be the microphone's too far over here. Okay. Excellent. Don't be shy. Come down to the front. You're the Justin Timers. I can identify with you. over there, one at the front, a few more at the front. There's more people, excellent. So we've got uh, two or three here, one over there, one here, one there. Amazing. Sell out capacity. Great. Okay, look, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Roy, I'm the Chief Executive here at the City Council. Um, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you have ever been to a, a council meeting where the councillors are present? Just to see how many of you got a sense of it. Yeah, so probably about a third to a half, which is quite interesting because you're at the heart of democracy in your city. Um, and you work for the organisation which helps bring together local democracy. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm very keen on at the moment is we celebrate that, uh, particularly in a world in which democracy seems to be disappearing at an ever alarming rate. So something for us to hold on to and celebrate. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about a few other things. We're going to talk, um, talk about looking back at our achievements over the last year, 2017-18. Um, <laughs> got one more person coming in. Uh, we're going to look forward to what's going to be coming up over the next sort of six months or so, looking into the year ahead, and also what we're doing to support you as vital members of staff in your jobs, because um, however much the challenges are ahead, um, we know that we're only going to overcome those if you're all functioning in really good form and that you're happy in your work and you're happy serving the community. Um, to help me today, I've got three speakers, uh, Alison McManaman, who's our Head of HR, um, Sam Mellander, who's um, a Health Development Specialist and is going to be talking about your health and your well-being, and then Laura Travitt, who's going to talk to you a little bit about a new offer that we've got around the staff shop, um, which is opening up some new uh, opportunities for you to financially benefit from working at the Council. But we're going to start just uh, by reminding ourselves about some of the fantastic work that you do. Um, every year we run something called the Big Difference Awards, um, and we're just going to see a little film which celebrates the people who won the awards last time round. I was amazed, really, quite surprised. It's absolutely huge, to be perfectly honest. I was so, so shocked. I didn't expect it. I was, yeah, really overwhelmed by it. I still, even though I've done it, can't get over it. We want to recognise uh, the really great achievements of our staff. They're really making a difference and they're bringing the purpose of the council to life. The biggest asset we have is actually our own staff. People talk about the council and they forget that the council is made up of people. I love my job, I'm passionate about it. I love coming into work every day. Oh, I love it. I mean, the whole reason I do my job is because I want to help people. With me, I'm here to help. 
and that's how I've always coached it and worded it. I just think I do my job and I just try to do it the best I can. That's clearly in them, in their nature, in their character or their personality. They want to help people. Rather than it's a customer and you're the council, it's two people interacting and engaging. Yeah. Most of the staff that have been here have all been here for a long time. 20 years. 13 years. Just over 9 years. 22 years now. About 17 years. 28 years. 14 years. 20 years this, this year. And I think that's a testament to how um, we enjoy working for the council and we find the council a, a positive employer. The council are great people to work for. That's really why I go that extra mile. Because if you've sorted someone's problem out, um, I feel that's great. And it doesn't cost nothing for that. If somebody were to come in with a major problem, we will go out of our way to find this. Oh yeah, we'll do, what we, we'll do what we need to. There is always going to be somebody there that can help that customer, no matter what. And that's what they do best. That's what they enjoy doing. That's what they like doing. Making a difference for, pe for people is what, is what you want to do. I like people. And, and that's the big thing. That has been the feedback. I'm, I'm helping people and it feels really good. That's what we're here for, isn't it, at the end yeah. of the day, to look after our customers. What, what can we do to help yeah. our customers and make things easier for them? We help the local community, we're here for the local community, we're here for everyone. These Big Difference Award winners and also the nominees really reflect the diversity of the work that the Council does day in, day out. We can use their work to showcase the work of all of our employees and to shine a light for the local community on the work, important work we do on their behalf. Brighton Hope City Council is a forward-thinking council. It was just the, the challenge of um, pushing the frontiers and boundaries and um, developing new service, a way of how we do things um, to improve our customer experience. Our staff do amazing things every day, but as part of our people promise, we want to ensure that we continue to recognise and say thank you and well done for the achievements that they're making day in, day out. It's just something that the whole organisation threw themselves behind. It definitely started a conversation. Yes, I think we have helped to empower people. Across the globe, people could learn from what we're doing. We are seeing a big shift in mm. how we deal with customers and how customers see the council. So that's, that's why people have the confidence in our council that when a problem arises, we can come up with a solution if we're given the resources to deal with it. We are an organisation which delivers really important services to our local community, but we only do that through the staff that we employ. We're committed to the council being a great place to work and delivering the very best for the city. OK, so rather than me um, switching the lights on and off, I think we've got another little film to show you, which is one of the individual award winners, um, uh, which is Shirley. Hopefully. Yeah. The winner of our individual award was Shirley Van Staden. Shirley went over and above uh, in her work. Um, she set up a community cafe. I saw the Big Difference Award on the council website and, and I immediately thought of Shirley. I was so, so shocked and surprised. It was visible for all to see that she felt very passionate and was going above and beyond. We had a really wonderful ceremony in Hope Town Hall, um, attended by the High Sheriff. One of the great benefits of involving um, the High Sheriff is we were able to offer an invitation to a garden party at Buckingham Palace. I still, even though I've done it, can't get over it. She deserved that recognition, actually. She's a very good role model, is Shirley. I've always tried, wherever I've worked, to do my best. As someone said to me once, you don't put 100 and you put 150 in. And I think that's me as a person. It brings happiness to me if I see people happy. And I think Holland Dean has got a great place for people to come, feel comfortable, and a very cheap cafe they need to use it. When we talked as a team about trying something different, uh, you know, and staff were coming to me and saying they'd like to give it a go as a community cafe, and Shirley very much keeps it going, just 
keeps that energy and enthusiasm going. I just think it's um, brought in a lot more people, get lots of nice comments. It touched me to think that people will write in and say things about me. <laughs> I don't do it for any fame or nothing, I do it because I love it. She really is the heart of this children's centre really. She's the first, one of the first people that parents see when they come in. People's first impressions when they walk through the door are really important and uh, Shirley sets the bar very high down there and makes everybody feel welcome. That's part of what Shirley's brought to the centre is a real passion for bringing the community in. I was so surprised and I'm really pleased that I have made a difference. Okay, so that was uh, Shirley with yeah, so a round of applause for Shirley. <laughs> also, there's a couple of others of you who are in the films, and I want to thank you very much as well for participating. We've got one more film. That was the individual award winner, but we do have a team award winner, um, and that was the Seafront team. The team award winner was the Seafront team. And what the Seafront team had done over the year, they'd saved a number of lives in very difficult conditions. So in October last year, um, some members of our team were called to an incident where um, somebody was trying to take their own life in the water. When Oscar and I arrived on scene, uh, what we were greeted with was something that was quite um, daunting. The conditions were really dangerous, uh, massive waves, more than eight foot. There was a... Um, a man uh, dressed in only jeans, uh, standing on a groin with uh, huge waves crashing all around. The gentleman was walking in an easterly direction towards the marina. Oscar and I were followed on quad bikes and there were about 20, 25 police officers. We elected to try and do something for them. We were running out of beach quite rapidly, um, getting closer and closer to the, to the marina. If there could be a worse meter square on the whole seafront, we were in it. It was either do something now or don't do anything. You can be dragged in and you are not able to come back here on the beach. He did slip. He fell into the water. Uh, he got dragged down the bank. I dived onto him, uh, grabbed him. Oscar grabbed me with the rescue tube. I managed to pull him out um, whilst getting smashed in, in the shore break against the wall. Had they not chosen to do that, uh, that person would clearly have died. Um, and I'm very proud of what they did. They really went above and beyond uh, that day to do what they felt themselves was important. A, a saving a life is like nothing I can even uh, describe. There's nothing to say. Feel that feeling is what makes uh, this job uh, the best job in the world, basically. We went home that day feeling like we uh, served a purpose on Earth. <laughs> we, we were just acting on instinct, I think and almost on autopilot, like all our training kicked in. There's a whole gambit of training that goes on um, just to try and cover all, all eventualities that we have on the seafront. It's that multi-skill set of competencies which they possess and which they deploy in every day and which make them really well-deserved winners. Do a round of applause for them too. Okay, they're amazing. And we, um, we showed the first film um, last week. We hosted all the chief executives from across the country. It's what's called the Solus Conference, um, the biggest ever conference they've had. They all came down to Brighton. So a couple of our colleagues were sitting in the audience became, were presented in t through the film and the work that we've done. So um, we've got good profile around the rest of the country with that. So they're, they're the Big Difference Awards, but that's not the only thing that you've been doing or you and your colleagues have been doing over the last year. A um, couple of other things have been going on. Oh, just let me just say about the Big Difference Awards. So it's open at the moment. Um, please think um, about nominating people. We try and give some prizes around there. We, as, as you heard earlier, um, we have a little event um, in Hove Town Hall. Um, it really is quite an uplifting experience. And if you think there's been people who've done some amazing stuff this this year, then please think about nominating them or nominating your team. Um, it's really good to hear your stories, and we use those stories to really promote the work that you do. So, uh, as I said, the uh, Big Difference Awards and the films that we've just shown them, they're, they're not the only things. They don't, they're not the whole thing that we do, and we do many, many things, but there's been a few other notable highlights over the last year. Um, 
We uh, entered a team into what's called the Local Authority Challenge. This is a national competition. And this is for people who are really looking to develop their career as managers. So they may be leaders in a certain area at the moment, but they're thinking about they'd like to become a manager or a director in the future. And so what we did was pull together a team, one from each directorate across the council, and they went in for a national competition. It's a really tough competition. They're thrown into um, a, a really demanding set of circumstances where a challenge is thrown to them. They've got, um, it's like a real life experience where you're being thrown all sorts of bits of information and you've got to react to it. Um, I said to the team, just, you know, have fun, just really enjoy it, learn from it, all the rest of it. Not only did they do that, but they actually won the national competition. Um, it's a really tough thing to do. And that's the team celebrating there. Um, I think they had a few beers at some stage as well on the way back on the train, but it was a really amazing achievement. Um, not only that, um, we won a Municipal Journal Award. Um, this is particularly um, around the work that the communications team did, and in particular Ruth Olsop. So many of you will know about the crowdfunding campaign for Madeira Terraces. Um, Ruth was quite instrumental in helping raise, I think, over £400,000 that the community's um, already raised and has helped us put in a, a heritage lottery fund to find more funding for Madeira Terraces. Um, we put that forward for a Municipal Journal Award, so that's uh, across the UK, the Municipal Journal, as some of you will read it. It's all our contemporaries across the local government world, um, and they were successful in winning the Innovation and Communications Award. Um, next one is uh, Ofsted. So anybody from Children's so Social Services here? Children's Services, Family Children Learning. There they are. So there's a few people in the room who have um, been quite involved in a huge amount of work. Um, Ofsted, for those of you who don't know what that means, is you have an inspection team that's basically a government inspection team that comes in to assess your performance. Um, and with Ofsted, it's a really serious thing. That's not fun. If, um, when, when we're assessed, the consequences for any council can be really, really serious if you're found not to be performing. And you'll know just generally that the issues around children's safeguarding is such a serious issue. It's really, really high in the government's mind, in the public mind, after the child sex abuse in Rotherham and other places. So the government's really keen to really test hard to see whether your children's services are up to scratch. Um, not only um, did we, um, did, I mean, it's a huge piece of work as well that has to be done, so the, the work was organised as a big inspection panel that came. And for the first time ever in our history, we were rated good by Ofsted. Um, there are many, many authorities don't achieve that. Um, so I think it was a really, really good achievement um, by um, ch Families, Children and Learning. And I want to take a particular tribute to Sarah because she was very instrumental in making sure that all of the Ofsted uh, inspection process went well. So a really, really brilliant achievement. So looking forward, what's on the horizon? Um, so I get to my page. Uh, there's a whole range of things you can anticipate will be coming up over the next period. And some things um, we know about and other things um, we don't, we can't anticipate. So certainly um, you'll be, those who've been around with the council for a while will be familiar with the fact that from really about July, September, October, November, um, there's a lot of work goes on with councillors about formulating the budget for the next financial year. Next financial year will be from... April 2019 all the way through to March 2020. And where we are at the moment, we're in the fourth year of a four-year plan. We agreed with government we do a four-year plan for the budget. That helps um, the councillors plan things. They've got a bit more sense of anticipating what might happen. It also means that there's less disruption for us as their employees. So we're able to plan the fact that if we're going to take money out of the budget, there's more advanced warning for people that we could end up with reducing services for both ourselves as employees but also the community who rely on the services. So where we are in terms of the timetable, I'll go into uh, a little bit. Um, Brexit, um, I mean it's in the papers all the time. Um, what will be the impact on Brighton and Hove? Local elections and where, what will be the implications for the priorities for the, council, for the new council going forward? So just to, on the budget... Um, this is the timetable for the budget. Um, so as I said, we've been doing work since July with the politicians. 
Um, we should find out sometime towards the end of this month in the autumn statement about what the overall financial settlement will be for local government. Sadly, when it comes to all the government departments, we're near the end of the queue. We are not up at the top. Uh, we're not the health service, we're not the NHS, so we're not right at the top of the government priorities. Um, the council will find out probably sometime around um, early December, we hope, sometimes it happens just before Christmas, what our specific financial settlement from government is. But meanwhile, within the council, in terms of the things that we can control, um, a report will be formulated which will say what are all the budget proposals from the administration um, and what is it they want to spend their money on? What are their spending choices? And um, obviously, what are the things that they are going to reduce spending on? So that will come forward to a, what's called a Policy Resources and Growth Committee before Christmas. It will be available for all the public to see um, probably early in um, uh, late November, early December. Um, the, the then is a process where the opposition parties will look at it and look at the budget proposals. Um, there may be some deals between the political parties, some negotiation, and then we arrive at what's called Budget Council on the 28th of February. So right at the end of February, they have to agree what the budget is. And they've been doing that day in, day out, for the last, sorry, year in, year out, um, for all, all the years that the council's been in existence. Um, and normally they're a, they are uh, able to arrive at some kind of budget agreement. But we will see. Um, I mentioned a bit of the context. Uh, it's the end of a four years of a four-year plan. Um, you will know um, the background to lots of reductions in expenditure in um, local authorities across the country. Um, we're now in a position where the government used to fund local authorities in Brighton and Hove to the tune of around about 105 million. Um, that figure is reducing down to nearer 6 million. So 100 million pounds worth of government funding has come out of our budget. We have been able to put up the council tax. Every time the council tax goes up 1%, that adds about £1 million worth of revenue to the council. So there has been some compensating um, increases in revenue. Councils can also put up fees and charges, parking charges, um, and other things which help fund the services. Um, but it's really tough to be able to balance the budget, but they've got to do it. Uh, they're obliged by law to have to do it. Uh, and we will try and keep people informed as much as possible. You may find that out through your local management teams or your directorate management teams, but certainly in terms of communication corporately, um, Alan and the team will try and keep up regular updates so you know what's happening. So just moving on to Brexit, um, your guess is as good as mine as to what will be the final outcome. Really difficult to predict. Um, what, uh, I mean, some of, the, some of the stuff on the slides I'll just talk briefly about, but really what it's trying to point to is all the things that might touch on our working life. So whether you agree with Brexit or don't agree with Brexit, just put that to one side. Um, uh, on the assumption that we will uh, exit from the EU at some point, there'll be all sorts of implications which can touch on our lives. Now, the government's been a bit shy about offering advice to local authorities as to what the specific impacts will, will be. Um, I know some of their civil servants have been doing some work around this, and I had a uh, letter from Joe Farrar, who's one of the senior civil servants at um, our parent department, MHCLG, saying that they're going to be holding some workshops shortly to talk us through what they think are going to be the implications. But we haven't just been waiting for them. Um, a number of people have been who work on resilience planning and emergency planning have been having a think about those issues uh, and have been working with colleagues across other councils. So you can probably guess that someone like Kent County Council will be worried about vehicles stacking up around the M25, that thing they call Operation Stack. But there are all sorts of other issues, particularly for our, where we've got regulatory services, food standards, hygiene standards, all of which are governed by European legislation at the moment and we'll need to think about what the implications are um, going forward. In terms of the local elections, um, so the local elections are held every four years in Brighton and Hove, as you know, many of you will know, and they're all out elections. All the councillors, all 54 councillors, put themselves up for the election. Um, the elections are in May. Um, the, um, uh, there will be uh, 
and, and there is an invitation for any of you to come forward if you want to be involved in helping with the local election process. So we have all sorts of different roles from involved in doing the count to working in polling stations across the authority. Um, so if any of you are interested, particularly those of you not been involved before and you'd like to learn a little bit more, it is paid for uh, and you do get a day off to do it. Um, so if you're interested, please get into contact with Michael Appleford and the electoral services team. We're always looking for new people to get involved. Um, in terms of after the election, um, or the run-up to the election and after the election, um, all the political parties will be starting to um, put out their manifestos, their political manifestos, their promises of what they're saying they're going to offer the local electorate if they get into office. And we've been doing a couple of things to try and support all of the political parties in that. We've been running a thing called 2030 Vision. We've been holding workshops, lectures, seminars to help the politicians formulate some of their ideas and to get a better idea about what, what can and can't be done in local government. About 50% um, of councillors, of those 54 councillors, about half of them are all going to retire or stand down. So there's going to be a lot of new councillors. And we're doing work to, um, for both candidates and after the election when they have become councillors to try and support them in their role to work out what it is they need to do. Um, and what we've also tried to promise for all the political parties is that whoever gets elected in May, by the following December, so within about six months, we will produce a new corporate strategy which will set out what they believe is their political priorities for the authority, give us some idea about what that means for us in terms of the services we deliver. And that way we try and create some certainty for us all about what we'll be doing for the next four years. Okay. So, uh, next bit, um, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to invite Ali McManaman to come up and talk to you a little bit about um, what you can expect from the council as your employer over the coming year and some of the work that we've been doing to try and improve your working environment and your working experience. Ali. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Ali McManaman, Head oh. of HR and OD, um, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to you a little bit about our people promise. Um, Do you want to turn it up the other way? Sorry? You might need to turn it All right. Yeah. This. Yeah, I think it's working. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we're keeping our people promise and what our people promise is. Um, so really, it's a package of work that we're putting together to make Brighton and Hove the best um, place it can be to work. So we've had a customer promise for a long time as an organisation, um, which is about how our customers experience the council. And the people promise is really about how employees experience the council as an employer and how do we um, make improvements that we know we can make in terms of our employee, employee offer. So I've worked for the council for many years and I've worked in lots of different parts of the council. I spent um, seven years working at CityClean. I can see some City Clean colleagues here today. So I've had lots of experience as a council employee and I know that um, in aspects we can be a great employer but I also know there's things we can do um, to be a better employer and this is um, the package of work we're putting together to try and improve things. So in terms of putting this work together, um, what we're doing is taking an approach of co-creation. So talking to people across the organisation about what people feel about working for the council, what's good and what could be better. So I've just got a few slides here um, which tell us something about what staff across the organisation have told us. So we've done focus groups involving about 200 members of staff where we ask the questions, what do you value about working for the council and what could be better? And you can see some things up on the slide that, you may, um, that may resonate with you. So some of the good stuff, people seem to really appreciate the fact that the local authority offers flexibility, flexible working and so on. And we know that in terms of some of our employment package, we benchmark really well against other employees. So that would be around things like our annual leave um, allowances and processes, the pensions we offer and so on. But in other aspects, on, on the other side of the side, that people have said are not so good about working for the council. Um, and those are some of the areas that we're really looking to address with some of the, some of the work we're doing. And you can see on there, you know, some of those things are probably more difficult to address than others, but we're, we're having a go at addressing them all. Um, we've also got a lot of uh, data as an organisation about our 
workforce. Um, uh, sorry, I seem to have... <laughs> There you go. Um, so we've got the staff survey, which is a survey that goes out to all staff across the organisation. Um, and what that has told us consistently is that staff across the organisation could feel more um, valued by the council. Um, and also, as an organisation, we could manage change better. So um, we've heard a little bit about the budget and about the changes that the council have been through. Um, and staff consistently tell us that that's an area we could perform better and also that we could have a clearer sense of direction so that sort of connection with where the council's going and the sense of direction and then as well as the staff survey we've got lots of data about the organization um, so we know from our sickness statistics that we have a higher than uh, benchmark level of sickness and we know that quite a large proportion of that is down to mental health and stress so th those are things that um, we really need to focus on. We know in some areas we find it hard to recruit staff and hard to retain staff, and in, that's in pockets, you know, specific jobs across the council. Um, we know we've got an ageing workforce, so that tells us something about what we need to do to support people as they get older in the workforce, and also how do we attract young people in, because our recruitment data tells us we find it quite hard, um, particularly in some roles, to attract young people into the council. And also, our workforce is not, at the moment, um, reflective of the community we serve in terms of diversity. So that's a really um, key area for us to address. So what are we doing about this? We've developed um, work streams that we're calling our People Promise. Um, and we've got a set of actions under each of these um, promises about how we're going to improve our, em our employment offer. So one of the very key work streams, um, for a number of the reasons I've already mentioned, is around wellbeing. I'm not going to talk in detail about this one because my colleague Sam from Public Health is going to um, specifically talk about what we're doing around wellbeing in a minute. Um, so the second promise is about being a fair and inclusive place to work. So this is really focusing on the diversity of our workforce, how we become um, more reflective of the community we serve, and how we improve the experience of staff when they're here in terms of people being treated with dignity and respect. So one of the key things I wanted to mention in terms of this work stream is we now have a mediation offer as an organisation. So there are colleagues across um, the various directorates who are now trained as mediators and have been working for about the last 10, 11 months as mediators. And this is in an effort to try and um, resolve workplace issues at an early stage and in an informal way. So another thing we know from our data is we tend to be quite a, or have historically been quite a formalised organisation in terms of having a high rate of sort of HR formal processes or grievances. Um, and mediation is proving really successful across the organisation in terms of resolving some of that and reducing our level of grievances. So we've had in the last year, for instance, a 14% reduction in grievances and nine out of ten of the um, mediation process we've have, had have, worked, have resulted in um, successful agreements. So that's proving really successful and that's quite a big um, thing in this work stream. But as I say, there's a whole host of activity under each, which um, there's more information available. So in terms of well done, recognised for good work. So we've watched some of the videos from the Big Difference Awards. So that's a big part of this work stream in terms of how we recognise the great achievements of people across the council so we know people do amazing things every day um, and how do we recognize that and thank people for the work they do for the council um, we're also going to hear a little bit later on about my staff shop which is one of the big initiatives um, that we've rolled out recently uh, which is about how we improve our benefits package and the potential financial benefits that um, may be available from working for the council um, one of the things we did, which actually was a result of our um, wellbeing survey, uh, one of the things was that people said they wanted more advice around pensions and planning for their future financial security. So we rolled out some pension workshops. They're completely oversubscribed, and you know we're going to be rolling more out of, that, um, of those. So uh, yeah, this work stream, we've done quite a lot around that. Um, opportunities to do your best is around how we develop people. Um, across the organisation. Um, so if you've had your PDP recently, um, you should have noticed a difference in the PDP format in that we now have a behaviour framework. 
So this is to support conversations um, between individuals and their managers about how work is done in the organisation, rather than just focusing on what we do. Um, so this is very much um, around our dignity and respect agenda as well, um, in terms of saying, actually, as an organisation, there are certain standards around behaviour um, that we expect, and the behaviour framework is a useful tool that can be used just to have those conversations. Um, and I also just wanted to mention apprenticeships. I think something that a lot of people aren't aware of is you can actually be an in-work apprentice, which, which means that you can apply to do apprenticeships in your current role. So there are two types of apprenticeships. One is for apprentices that come in in the sort of more traditional sense, and the other is, you know, in your actual role, you can then do an um, apprentice, and there's lots of information available um, about that, and that, that scheme's run by our colleague Carla in um, Families, Children and Learning. So, so lots going on around how we develop people to do their best across the organisation. Um, and then developing a good place to work. This is, some of this work stream is about our physical work environment, um, and we've been working with colleagues in the work styles team, particularly around things like lighting issues um, in Hovetown Hall that I've, I know have been sort of ongoing issues, and some of the heating issues and air quality issues in Bart's house, and lots of other um, things about our physical working environment where we're trying to listen to staff and do, do something to improve that. Um, and another thing I just wanted to mention is we've recently relaunched our volunteering policy. So this is where people have got an opportunity to try different volunteering um, opportunities, uh, and there's uh, the chance to have a few days per year to do volunteering in the community. So those are the five work streams um, that make up our people promise. And as I say, it's an evolving piece of work and we're continuing um, to co-create working with various forums. And we're going to hear a little bit more about wellbeing now from my colleague Sam, um, and this is a key work area. Thank you, Ali. working. Can you hear me? Have we got sound? Good. Everything's going well. Um, hi everyone. Um, my name's Sam and I work in the public health department. Um, and for those of you that might not be aware what that is, um, kind of name does what it says on the tin. Um, we generally look at the health of the uh, public of the city. Um, but for this kind of particular piece of work, I've been kind of working with council and looking at how we can improve the staff of health and wellbeing. So I'm going to talk kind of a little bit about that. Um, it's really nice to be here, uh, one, because I'm really passionate about this work stream, so I'm kind of really looking forward to sharing it. And um, two, in exactly 25 days, I'll be getting married in this spot, so it's quite nice to see the room full. So that's nice. Um, right, that's enough about me. Uh, so to, I guess to start the well work stream, we kind of looked at it the way we in public health look at needs in the city, and it's always good to start with asking people about what their needs are and what it is that they want us to do. Um, so in January and February of this year, we did a staff um, health and wellbeing survey. That was kind of loosely based around the public health needs assessment um, that, that's used nationally. You don't need to know too much about that, but I guess just that the questions are things that other places have used as well. Um, one in three of you filled it in, so thank you for that. Um, obviously, the more people that fill it in, the much better it is for us to kind of get a feel for what it is that you want. Um, and it showed us actually quite, quite a lot of really in, useful and kind of interesting information. So I thought it would be quite fun to kind of, rather than me just talking through in kind of loads of slides, to get you kind of chatting about it. Uh, so we're going to do a bit of a quiz. I say quiz. I'll read some questions out um, in the kind of, I guess, rows next to you, have a chat about what you think the answer are. Uh, this row here have the answers, so if you could not look at those, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, I, I guess I'll go through them and give a bit of information and just thought it would be a good way to present it. Um, so, keeping active is kind of, I guess, the first theme. Uh, the physical activity recommendations are that we do 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise um, a week. Uh, so there's, kind of, there's some examples there. Um, what percentage uh, of staff do that recommended amount in the council? Um, just have a chat amongst yourselves. What do you think that percentage is? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll, 
I'll, I'll stop you there. Has anyone got any guesses? Anyone want to... What do you think it's most likely to be? We went 50%. 50%? Okay. Um, that's 30%. So... I guess this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, I think that kind of reaction of, oh, we could probably do better is, is you know, maybe something that we want to think about. Um, and I guess we in public health will often talk about actually just doing it in 10-minute chunks can make it a little bit more manageable for people. Um, we looked into this data a little bit more, and we found that the, some of the staff that have got lowest um, physical activity kind of that work for the council are usually people who work part-time with children and also who have caring responsibilities. That definitely doesn't surprise me, and it probably wouldn't surprise anyone else that busy people find it hard to be active. Um, so we are kind of conscious of that, and part of what, the way we're planning this work is to make sure it's accessible for people, because that's really important. Um, there we go. Uh, so more physical activity recommendations. Um, the guidelines are also that as well as that kind of cardio-based, adults do two or more days of muscle strengthening exercise a week. Um, so I won't kind of get you to chat about it, but I'll show you what that answer is um, just because I think it's interesting. Um, it's actually a little bit higher. So we're 50%. So which, again, that surprises a lot of people. Um, but I think a good message for this is that often people think muscle strengthening exercise is just going to the gym and lifting weights, but actually so many other things count, like yoga counts, um, you know, go to Tesco's, carry your food shop home, that counts, uh, lifting toddlers, that, that definitely counts, they're quite heavy. Um, so there's kind of other ways that people can get that muscle strengthening that isn't just going to the gym. So again, with these messages we're giving people, it's about making it accessible so people can do it, um, but also in a way that works for them. Uh, right, final question around keeping fit. Um, we asked some questions around whether, what mode of transport people use to get to work, and we also asked some questions around how close they live to where they work. So pulling all that data together, we've managed to work out the percentage of Brighton and Hove City Council staff who walk to work who live within a mile of the building that they work at. Um, chat to your partners for just a couple of seconds about what percentage you think that is. <laughs> Sorry, trying to be quick in things. Um, so, ooh. oh no, oh my button's not working. Oh, there we go. Okay, seventy-four percent. So, I think um, I guess that's quite high, and that's really good. Um, and while I know not everyone is going to be able to walk to work, I think it shows that actually, even just in that mile radius, there's definitely some work we can do to kind of improve people being able to travel actively to work. Um, again, for people who really struggle to fit activity in. Active travel is a really great way to kind of fit that in and make it part of your daily routine, um, which is why I thought I'd put those questions there. Um, so moving on from physical activity, uh, we also asked you all about sleep. Um, so what percentage of staff have had problems sleeping in the last month? Bearing in mind the last month was January, February time, not now. Um, have a chat, what do you think that is? Yeah, so that really surprised me too, actually, when we did it. Um, and that's obviously quite concerning because 80% saying that they've got trouble sleeping in the past month is really, really high. So sleep's definitely something, um, particularly in public health, we're really interested in it um, because it's, it's just a fascinating health topic. Um, but it is something we're going to look at. Um, but also kind of within that, because I checked the figures, 14% of people have said that they have trouble sleeping every single day, um, which again is really, really high. Um, so... We're going to do some work and look at, well, you know, why is that happening? What can we do about it? And really try and support staff because your rest is really important. Um, and obviously, that's pretty important for your health as well as your work. Um, so we asked people and we gave them kind of a list of possible options. What, uh, what things they'd be interested in, in terms of kind of advice and support. What out of those four things, again, have a chat, do you think people said they were most interested in? It was actually... 
actually, um, it was NHS health checks, and these are listed in order of the things that people ask for. So the first most common thing people ask for was NHS health checks, then pension advice, then physical activity, then support around mental health and stress. Um, the, again, I'm really glad you asked the question. The pension question surprised me. That probably says a bit about where my head's at, and I yeah, need to think about that at some point. But um, again, it's really good to ask the question. So these are the top four, and these are things that we're looking into doing things about because we know that they're important to staff. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, an NHS health check is a cardiovascular health check for people over the age of 40, and it's looking at reducing... Um, things like heart disease, stroke, and those risk factors. So we, um, we've actually piloted um, some health checks already in the council, and we're looking at kind of rolling that out because it's clearly important to people. Uh, getting near the end, um, so we also asked people what percentage of staff said they find their job extremely or very stressful. Um, just conscious of time, so I'm going to click through, or, or not. Nope. There we go. Um, so 19%. So again, for some people, they might be surprised and think, oh, that's quite low, whereas other people might say, well, 19% is still too high. Um, so again, we're still looking at that. Um, I know the council have put on more resilience training again, because that's really important in helping those people who are struggling to cope with stress. Um, and then finally, um, I think most pr people probably know the recommendations around fruit and veg are five a day. Um, so we asked staff about this. Um, I won't kind of we can chat about this at the end if you want to. Um, but about 50% of our staff do. Um, and when we looked at the data, because I like to look for kind of comparisons and groups and how they're different, uh, our older staff are much more likely to get their five a day and our younger staff are significantly less likely to do it. Probably not that surprising, but again, if we're kind of thinking about that, why is that, how can we support them, what's going on there? Um, so, as well as asking, um, I guess, quantitative questions, so where we basically turn things into percentages, part of the wellbeing survey was also getting... Um, people to write their comments and give us their feedback and things. Um, I read every single one of those comments and then collated them and did some complex things with them, but I've kind of pulled out some of the quotes to really indicate that based on what people have said, if things came up frequently, we've really looked at how we can put that into place. So um, menopause, that came up. Um, actually, that came up quite a lot. So we've put on some workshops for all staff. There's two. There's one that's aimed at people who experience the menopause to kind of help and support them with their experience of it, how it's affecting them. But there's also a second one, which is um, called Managing the Menopause, and it's for people who either are managers of people who may experience the menopause or work closely with people who may, to kind of give them an understanding of how they can support them as well. Um, particularly good for men who may not have um, a massive kind of understanding around it. So and those have been really fully subscribed, so it's really good to see that people, I guess, are reacting well to that. Uh, pensions, again, that came up loads, um, so we've put pensions workshops on there full, so we're looking at how we can roll more out and also do kind of um, e-learning as well, because we know not everyone can get to the sessions. Uh, health checks again came up, so we're looking at health checks. Um, this comment came up an awful lot, talking about that actually gyms can be not that accessible. Um, so we have um, the councils negotiated with uh, Freedom Leisure a reduced cost membership. Ooh, where's the, oh, no, there we go. Um, so it's £31 a month. Um, Freedom's standard gym membership is £51, and the old corporate deal was £46. So we've negotiated it down to £31, um, which for some people is going to be really good, and it means that they can kind of join the gyms and get access to all those um, if, if you're a gym goer, it's a pretty good deal. Um, also to note, if you are already on the £46 rate, um, this can apply to you as well. You just need to get in touch and ask them, and they'll drop it down. Um, so if you are a member, do make sure you get in touch. Um, I think that's great. I'm really excited. I think it's a really good um, kind of way we've gone with it. It's important to you, so what can we do about it? However, I do know that for some people, £31 is still going to be a lot of money, or gyms aren't going to be accessible because it, it's the time to kind of go and get there. So kind of as well as that, as that, we're looking in January to, with the kind of Public Health and Healthy Lifestyles team, to look at how we can do some sort of free and low-cost exercises and look at physical activity for people that the gym either just isn't kind of workable for them. So we are kind of doing more things around this. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the mental health training that's coming up. There's also medical advice lines um, and counselling services. Um, and I guess my very final slide um, is I want you to kind of think about you and what we can kind of do further with this. So I guess my three kind of 
calls to action, if you want to call it that, is um, what could you do in your team? Could you think about uh, at lunchtime going out and going for walks and getting away from your desk more if you are desk-based? Um, we can kind of support you with some physical activity workshops if you want to get in touch and we can build all that up. Uh, we'll, we'll be outside in the kind of rooms two and three if you want to come chat to us about any of these things. Uh, I guess you as an individual, do you want to join the gym? Do you want to give up smoking? You know, what is it that you want to do? Because we've got services within the council that can really help you for that. And, you know, we can do lots of things towards your well-being, but it's also about, well, what do you want to kind of take away and do? And I know it feels like a really long time away, but I thought I'd put on there, please fill in the survey again, because although one and three is good, we could, you know, we could go higher than that. And actually, if we're going to react to what people are saying that's important to them in health and well-being, the more people that fill it in, that gives us more data, which will make that kind of better. Um, so thank you. If you want to come and chat to me and my colleagues about any of this at the end, I'll be outside. Um, but there we go. Thank you very much. So I'm here today to talk to you about your newly launched employee benefit scheme. Um, so can, before I start, can I just have a quick show of hands as to who has signed up, activated, or is using my staff shop at this time? Perfect. That's really great to hear. Um, so yeah, basically, for those of you that haven't, um, we can sign you up in rooms two and three today after this meeting. Um, so yeah, feel free to pop along. You can ask me any questions. I'm here till about half four. But I'm just going to take this time just to run through a few slides with you, just to give you an insight as to what my staff shop is and how we can help um, save you some money. So basically, um, with the platform, it is in effect a website. It's a website that you have access to 24-7 that gets you discounts on your everyday expenditure. So this is what the platform looks like. The idea is you go on and you access different categories. So it might be that you're looking to get yourself a saving on a holiday. It might be that you want to get yourself a saving on food shopping, cinema tickets, going out with the kids, pretty much anything. You can get a discount deal, saving or promotion through this one site. Um, so as, as you can see, we've got different categories, all that are basically based on everyday expenditure. So the platform is accessible, as I say, 24-7. It doesn't just have to be accessed on a computer. You can access it on your smartphone. You can download the bookmark, which is basically a fully mobile-enabled site. So when you're out and about in the town center or you're dining out, whatever it might be, you can still have access to the My Staff Shop platform to get you a discount. So each of you should have been issued with a membership card. If you haven't, we have got some in uh, room two and three that you can take away today. But basically, this membership card is linked to what we call Love to Shop. Some of you may or may not have heard of Love to Shop, but basically it's a combination of um, shops that have joined together, and they're known as the Love to Shop schemes, and you can use this card in 50 of them. So there are around 50 in total, so the likes of Argos, Boots, Curries, M&S, etc., all accepting this one card. So it's not one card for every different retailer, it's just this one single card that you can take into the likes of Curries, pay with this card, but each time you pay with this card, you're getting a 7% discount. Now, by all means, I can um, explain that in more detail when you come along to see me in room two or three, but as I say, you are getting yourself a 7% discount by using this one card, okay? That's the shops that it can be used in, so you can print that list off. Um, as I say, there is the likes of Boots, Halfords, M&S, Curry's, Debenhams, etc., all that accept that one card. There is a second use for the card, and I'll come on to that in a little moment. Um, but as I say, that's the main use for that one card. I'm having a problem. There we go. 
So we understand that the 50 retailers linked to your membership card is not every single retailer out there. So what we have done is created a category called the discounted e-code gift card and voucher superstore. So this is where you'll find discounts from the likes of Tesco, Primark, etc., all offering you a discount via either an e-code, a voucher, or a reloadable gift card. So you can purchase those through my staff shop, and the idea is you put money onto them, and you, then you take them into the relevant retailer. So what we've done is we've created different categories on the platform because we understand that you know, there's a lot of retailers, so we've subcategorized each, each section. So it might be supermarkets, it might be health, it might be beauty, etc. And the idea is when you click into each relevant category, that's where you'll be presented with the retailer offering that discount. So as an example on the screen, we've got all the supermarkets. Um, so you'll see down the bottom Sainsbury's, Morrison's, Tesco, all offering you a discount because let's face it, we all do food shopping. Um, so the idea is, is to get you a saving on your food shopping. But that's just one category, obviously just one small part of my staff shop. So if we take one of the gift cards as an example, how it's used. So Primark on the screen here, offering a 5% discount. So if we were going into Primark, spending £100, we could simply order a Primark gift card from my staff shop. We would post it out to your home address. And the idea is, if you wanted to put £100 onto your Primark gift card, you simply do that through the platform, but you save yourself £5. Okay, £5 doesn't sound a lot, but obviously with that one transaction, that one retailer, it can soon add up to a significant saving of all the retailers that you are using over the course of 12 months. So we're trying to say, look at the bigger picture. Look at it over the course of 12 months of how much you are going to be saving yourself and your family. Okay, so majority of the cards are reloadable. So the idea is... When they're in your possession, you keep hold of them. So it's not like at Christmas where you get a next gift card. Once you get that gift card and the funds have been used from it, you throw it in the bin. The idea with these is once they're in your possession, you keep hold of them and you keep topping them up as and when you want to. Okay? Okay, so moving on to what we call a virtual currency, i.e. cash back. So all the discounts and deals that I've been mentioning so far are an instant upfront discount, okay? But what we have also developed is cashback. Now, we can't call it cashback, so we call it wow points. Now, as I say, wow points are a virtual currency, and the idea is, as you shop through my staff shop, you can earn yourself cashback. Now, one wow point equals one pence, but the good thing is, as I say, it's giving you that option as to how you want to save. So it might be that you want to opt for the 7% discount, or it might be that you want to opt for a cashback amount. So it just depends on how you prefer to shop. Me, I do a little bit of both. So if I'm topping up my Tesco card each month, I opt for the 4% discount to get myself that instant saving. Whereas if I do a bit of online shopping at, say, John Lewis or somewhere like that, I tend to opt for the wow points. So as I say, I'm a little bit of both, but it's given you the option to do one or the other. Okay, so moving on to daily offer. Some of, the, some of you that have already activated may or may not have seen daily offer, but this is basically a different deal that we feature every day. Okay, so it might be that you can earn 5% cash back on your fuel. It might be if you shop at Aldi and Lidl, will give you a percentage loaded onto your membership card. It might be two adult Odeon cinema tickets for just £6, etc. So each day, the deal changes. They are limited by number, so you do have to be quick. But the way to access these, as I say, is by logging onto the site each day, and then you can redeem them through that. Something else we feature is also, um, again, a little bit different because we didn't want to just offer you the static discounts every day. We wanted to sort of change it up a little bit. Um, so we do something called My Price Drop. This, in effect, is a bit like a Dutch auction. So rather than a generic auction where the price keeps rising, 
With the My Price drop, it's the opposite. So the price will drop each moment. So we might have a Cornish break on there. We might have a Samsung TV, an iPad Pro. Again, it's different things that are offered through My Price Drop. And the good thing is the price is dropping. So again, they are limited by number, but it's a case of who dares wins. So you purchase that item when you feel you want to pay that price for it. Okay, so coming back to the membership card, the, the little card that I mentioned at the beginning, the Love to Shop card. As I said, it has got two uses, and its second use is basically you can use this card in a number of different local independent retailers. So, so retailers we call My Local Deals. And the idea behind this is you simply take the card into any of the participating independents, show the card, and you will get a discount. It might be 10%, it might be a free coffee, it might be a free haircut after six visits, etc. Providing they are participating independent retailers, you will get access to the discount. It's not just based in Brighton, it is a nationwide thing. So even if you were going over to Taunton in Somerset, still be sure to take your membership card with you because you can still have access to their local deals as well. So what we've devised is a, a little map that pinpoints all of the local deals in your area. And then going on from that, you can then break it down so you can see all of the different restaurants, florists, cafes, hair salons, etc., that are offering you a discount just by purely showing the card in any of those retailers. So it couldn't be simpler. So you don't have to top the card up to use it. All you're doing is just simply showing it and they will give you that discount. We also take recommendations on. So if you've got a family friend or you know somebody that runs an independent business that would be willing to give a small discount, please let us know. Um, and as I say, we will try our best to get them on board on the platform to obviously extend your savings on a regular basis. It could even be a fish and chip shop bar. Anything that you can think of that's an independent business, let us know and we'll get them on. So moving away from my local deals, moving on to a different category called my holidays. Um, so I'll whiz through these fairly quickly. Um, but even if you're looking at booking your next package holiday or if you're looking at booking flights only, hotels, etc., be sure to check out the my holidays section because you'll be surprised as to what saving you can get. Eating out, I enjoy eating out, I'm sure a lot of you do, um, so why not check out the My Dining section, because again, it might be that you're sitting at the table, your bill comes, it might be 50 quid, you're in Pizza Express, you could simply pop onto your smartphone, order a discounted e-code, hey, you might save yourself 20%. Easy peasy. So it's just obviously exploring the platform, finding different ways that you can obtain a saving, but also, as I say, being savvy with it as well and having that available on your smartphone. Cinema, this is again a really popular area because what we offer is something called instant e-codes. So it might be that you're on the way to the cinema, you want to go to Odeon, there are two of you going, you can simply order discounted e-codes through ourselves that you then take to the ticket office at the Odeon Cinema, present that as your method of payment, but you are getting it for 50% cheaper. So it's a case of ordering the tickets. You don't state what film you're going to watch. All you're doing is stating the amount of people that are going to watch the film. Order the tickets through us, take your e-code to the ticket office, and away to go. But by doing it in that way, as I say, you are saving yourself up to 50%. So there's another category called My Car. Again, I'll whiz through these um, fairly quickly. Health and fitness, again, um, I know Sam mentioned about um, discounted gyms, etc. cetera. Um, there is a category on there that you can check out if you don't want to join Freedom Leisure. There's different um, deals and discounts that you can get on gym memberships. Simply type in your postcode, it'll bring up all of the deals available in your area. 
There we go. And just finishing off with any questions, as I say, what I will be, well, I'll be based in room three, so just over the hallway. If you have any questions or you're unsure how to use your account or you've signed up and you're not quite sure what to do or you're awaiting a gift card or anything like that, so any questions at all, I am in the room opposite till about 4.30. So I'd be more than happy to have a chat to you, obviously walk you through any sections that you're unsure about. But also for those of you that haven't already activated, we have got the facility to activate you today. It'll just take sort of a couple of minutes. You can then get onto the platform and start enjoying all of these savings. But the only thing I will suggest is set aside some time just to have a good look through the platform because there is a hell of a lot on there. I've only just sort of skimmed on the surface, but it's a case of obviously having a look at the different categories that are on there, the interests that you have. I'm sure not everything will be of interest for you, but as I say, have a good look through, explore the different categories, and hopefully my staff shop can get you a saving on your everyday expenditure, especially given the time of year coming up as well. Obviously, we're doing a lot more shopping for Christmas presents, etc., so you will be surprised as to what savings you can get. All right, but I look forward to speaking to you over the way in, in a short while. Thank Thanks you very much. So um, there isn't just um, my stuff shop. There's a few other things over in the uh, room, which I think I can find it. Yeah. The back. Oh, there we go. So there's a few things in that room. Um, can you just take um, a couple of minutes just to have a think between you about some questions? Um, just a couple of minutes, just have a chat with, with your colleagues, uh, and then we'll spend um, the rest of this time that we've got together uh, just to quickly go through any questions that you've got today from any of the speakers who've been with us. Um, if it's very specific questions, probably, and it's about my shop, then uh, talk to Laura in the room next door. So just a couple of minutes, and then I'll, I'll check in with you. Questions, answers. Anybody got? Um, I've got a microphone. Anybody got questions they like to ask? Sorry, but if you, there's things that you'd like to, to raise, and you can raise anything. Hey, I don't. don't All right, okay. <laughs> So there, um, there has been um, annually negotiated pay rises, um, and um, we've got uh, Richard from Unison here can talk more about some of those. Um, so there has been, but pay rises uh, have been probably been below the rate of inflation over the last few years, I suspect. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why we were so keen on the my shop, I know for some of you may feel that's rather commercial. But if it's about money in your pocket, we're trying to save something that's a practical thing that we could try and do. Um, I think um, the other thing that's been happening with pay is that we um, have been really focusing on people who are at the bottom of the pay scale. So the Brighton Living Wage has been something which has been incorporated over a number of years into our pay line. Um, that will start to raise some issues because um, people who are on the lowest pay rights have bring, been bringing up their pay, and that's you know, that's the bigger number of people who work for Brighton House at the Council. Um, that will start to have an impact on differentials, if that's what you know what I mean, that um, some people will suddenly find that if they're on a scale four, they're actually at a pay level, which is at the lowest level uh, in the organisation. Um, I've 
uh, raised it with all the politicians that I think pay is an issue for us as a local authority. I'm not shy to say that um, uh, we offer very good value for money uh, as, a, as a workforce um, for councillors and for the local community. We are, we are not the best paid um, if you look across the south coast. Um, that's a real challenge for councillors um, because obviously if they put our pay up, that's less money they've got from delivering services. Um, it also means that they've probably got to think about the trade-off between how much they pay us and how many of us there are, because the budget is only finite. Um, however, I think that they, they are aware that in some areas we're finding it difficult to recruit because our, um, the actual amount of money we pay is not as good. And we, as Ali was mentioning earlier, um, we will offer, um, where it's proven that you can't recruit someone, um, we will off offer what's called a market supplement. But obviously that, that's by exception, it's not to the whole of the workforce. Um, it's got to be in areas where it is genuinely difficult to recruit and we can prove that's the case. Um, there, I think, will be an issue in the coming years where we're going to talk to the councillors about what do they want to do about pay going forward. Um, and that will be something they'll have to handle very carefully because anything that's done to your pay is something that you're going to be very concerned about and, and I would be too. Um, so I think we're aware of it. Um, it's um, not something that is a magic wand to find a solution in terms of magically increasing our pay. The budget's finance, but, uh, finite, so pay ourselves more money, there's less money for services. There will be fewer of us delivering them. So there's a bit of a trade-off and that, that the members will need to think very carefully about that. I think if you have views about that and you want it to be um, brought up at future sessions, I'm very happy to do it. I know um, the trade unions, I think, will be keen as well to understand what their members' needs are, um, but I do think it will be a uh, discussion for the future. Sorry. Do you want a microphone? Is that on the coin collection? That's right. Yeah. So do people know about the coin collection? Um, we, we were scammed as a council. So you know we have a lot of pay and display machines uh, for parking, for people and um, up until very recently a lot of those were coins, you put a pound in or whatever the fee was. Um, and a, there was a company working, not just for us, they were working for private companies and other local authorities that was doing the coin collection. Um, and effectively they went into liquidation and we weren't the biggest losers actually, but the council lost something like um, three million pounds. Um, there, there has been an attempt to pursue that loss of revenue in terms of the courts and police action. Um, but when companies go into liquidation, any of you who's ever suffered from that, from being on the receiving end of it, it's incredibly difficult to try and get your money back. So on that particular issue, um, one of the challenges was getting the politicians to accept that um, having cash collection is a high-risk strategy. Um, actually, colleagues in the transport team have been pointing out this for many years, but one of the things that many councils will say is not everyone has a mobile phone to do pay by phone, not everybody has a, a bank account to do a charge card. Well, actually the numbers of people who don't, and especially those who own a car that don't have um, a mobile phone or charge, is tiny. So after a um, fair amount of debate with members, they eventually did agree, and we have far more um, collection, uh, far more of our um, car parks are done now by payment by phone, and that's one of the ways in which you can de-risk cash going missing. Um, in terms of um, uh, uh, how do we operate to prevent fraud, which is another way in which you could talk about that issue. So we have an internal fraud team and they, do, uh, they look at where the high risk areas are. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be about money. It could be other areas in which there could be um, things which we don't want to be happening. And the internal fraud team every year does a review and they look at particular areas where they believe risk of something 
that we don't want to happen happening. Um, we also do reports as an audit and standards committee. Um, so it's, there's public accountability for what we do. That's a, that's a meeting that takes place in public. Um, so we don't try and hide what happens. We try and learn the lessons from that. Uh, in terms of public procurement, um, so the council is a mixed economy. It does some stuff that we do in-house and, and each political administration has a view on whether they think they should outsource or insource something, keep it the same or change something. So for those of you working in housing department, a lot of you will be aware of um, that the MIAS contract for housing repairs and maintenance is coming up for renewal. Um, there are different views amongst councillors, um, but the report is going up um, later this year, next year, with options on whether it should be an in-house service or a uh, service where we use contractors, and there'll probably be a bit of both, even in that new contract arrangement. Um, the um, public procurement team also does quite a lot of work in making sure that we get value for money. Um, so there are some people who will work in commissioning teams when they're commissioning new services from providers, and we commission service from the voluntary sector, it's not just private companies, and we commission services from other public sector organisations. Um, as well as providing in-house services ourselves. Um, they do a lot of work and are increasingly vigilant about making sure that the way in which the commission is set up and the way in which contracts are drawn up, that we're getting value for money. There is a piece of work um, going on which is looking at contract management and we're thinking, we're hoping we can achieve, I can't remember the exact figure, but I think it's up to a million pounds in savings through more effective contract management. Um, so there's, there is... Um, there, there's never a perfect solution to these things. We have had fraud within our council by our own staff um, who've committed fraudulent acts. Bringing something in house doesn't stop fraud and people ripping the council off and misusing public funds. Um, putting it out doesn't guarantee that people will misuse public funds. Lots of our contractors are very clear about their reputation. They need to protect it. Is that helpful? You want to help? Yes, I mean, uh, I, I can't recall all the detail. What I do know is there was, there was just very poor management by that company of their funds. And um, uh, I, what's the word? I'm not sure it's sub because I don't know whether it's come to court. So it's probably, I can't really, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember all the detail of this. It's, it's a little while ago, about two or three years ago, wasn't it? I think that that happened. Um, I think the police are, were st still are pursuing a case, but whether it will ever come to court, I don't know. But I think you, yeah, you, you may know more than I do about the details of that. Um, but yes, if it's poor management practice, then that's our own fault, really. It's quite a specific question. Anybody else got any more? It's a good question, though. Anybody else? Hi. Yes. Do you, do you mean laptops and mobile devices, or yeah? So, so. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely, and uh, there's no doubt we've been behind the curve. I mean, one of the real challenges, isn't it, in our private lives, um, we move with the technology. We have smartphones, and we can adopt those technologies um, quite readily. So you then have to ask the question, so why can't the council do that? Why can't we have laptops and mobile devices so quickly? Um, it, it's, a, it's a more complicated uh, answer than I can probably give justice to today, and it would need colleagues from IT&D to be here. Um, to talk you through that. But one of the key priorities is to invest in some of the infrastructure to do that. So if we don't have um, the right platforms on which to use mobile technology, it's all very well having a mobile phone for a laptop, but if you can't access the applications, it's a bit pointless really. You just don't get the value out of it. 
So the first thing we're doing is that there is a, work, there's a new working group that was set up about a year ago, which is really trying to drive improvements in the way in which we create the infrastructure. So that's the Wi-Fi in the, in the council, the Wi-Fi outside, um, the wiring and the servers, the res resilience of those servers so that they don't go down and the system collapses. And one of the benefits that we've got from the Orbis partnership is that we get that experience and learning from the different authorities. So Surrey have been more advanced in their thinking on this than we have done, and their experience is really helping us drive to get to a quicker solution. In terms of rollout of uh, mobile devices, um, there is a rollout program. I think one of the key priorities is, I don't know if you're in social work, I'm sorry, I don't know where you're from. Environmental health, okay. So we'll have to, uh, I don't know the answer about environment, health and detail, but I know one of our priorities is definitely the social work teams. Social work teams often have to have quite a lot of administration. Um, actually, Sarah, you might know more about this than I do, but the social work teams often have a lot more administra administrators around them to bring forward and backwards files. But by having mobile technology, it will enable them to be able to access files much more quickly. Uh, that actually can make us more efficient in the way in which we work. I'd have to come back to you on your particular one, but there is genuinely, is, uh, the, we, we, we are catching up. Um, we are definitely behind the curve, but we are catching up in terms of rollout mobile devices. Um, uh, and the quicker we can get there, the better as far as I'm concerned. But there's no point just rushing at it and handing out mobile devices that you can't then use uh, in, in, for, for, the, for your job. Yeah, no, I, it absolutely is, and uh, I think that's probably been one of the things in the staff surveys about give us the tools to do the job, and we've been saying that for, or you've been saying that probably for about 10 years, I think. Um, the challenge for us is the resource pot to do it. Um, so over the last four years, we had something called the Modernisation Fund. That fund was about £24 million pounds we've been using, partly to make the savings, uh, I know it sounds a bit odd, but to make savings you sometimes got to spend money um, because our councillors really don't like saying we're going to close the service down. So we don't close services down, what we do is we try and re-engineer them to carry on working with less funding and one of the ways in which we do that is to look at our um, IT equipment to do that. The pace at which we need to invest, the amount of money that we have is not sufficient to be able to get to a faster pace of change. So we're making progress, but I will absolutely accept that it's not at the speed in which you need it to be to be able to do your job more effectively. In thinking about the budget for the next four years, so after May election and thinking about that period forward, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to how can we identify a pot of money that we can say to the new council, you need to invest in your services. Here's the pot of money for you to do stuff, but here are all the competing demands for it as well. So you'd have to prioritise where you're going to invest. So I'm hoping that um, we can be clearer with the investment pot for the next four years so we can try and give some certainty and assurance that we can roll out that technology more quickly. But I, I, I hear your frustrations. I, I genuinely do. I know it's a real problem. Anybody else? Okay, so uh, income is one of the four sources, of, four or five sources of income. So we have council tax, which we, count, which we uh, get from council taxpayers. Business rates, we don't get all the business rates. We get about half the business rates. Uh, we have fees and charges, and then we have income that comes from asset that we own. So we own the freehold for Marks and Spencers and a couple of other shops, and we get an income from that as well. So we've got quite a big property portfolio. So the third one of those, which is around fees and charges. 
So every year in the budget cycle, uh, the members look at the options to be able to put up their fees and charges. So car parking is probably one of the biggest ones in the city. Uh, I guess you could say it's probably the nearest thing to a tourist tax because a lot of the car parking revenue comes from tourists and visitors to the city. We are still cheaper than NCP and the other private sector parking companies. Uh, and the members look at that every year and wonder, can they put up their fees and charges? The challenge they have is um, there's often a bit of pushback from businesses who say, don't make parking fees too expensive because that will put people off. So they need to check in to make sure, is there any evidence of that? If we put the fees and charges up for parking, will people stop shopping in Brighton? Thankfully, at the moment, there isn't too much evidence to suggest that. So by and large, over the last few years, they have been putting up parking charges. One of the problems, though, is we just can't spend parking revenue on whatever we want. It ha by law, it has to be spent on transport services. So they're often it's not just the case that you can put up the money and spend it whatever you want. It's constrained. Second thing is we've been looking at um, other areas where they do charge fees. Um, one of those being our cemeteries and mortuaries. So, um, a bit of a sombre moment to talk about that, but um, they have looked at putting up their fees and charges. What they've found, though, is that many of the private sector uh, companies who are in the city, they've been bringing their fees and charges down. So it's not like it's um, completely elastic, you know, put the, put the charges up and people just carry on paying. People say, well, I don't want to buy that service. Um, and of course that's something that's often quite challenging for us who work in public sector because we're not used to the, you know, we get our money from government in the past that's helped us fund things. And when you've suddenly got to decide what price point do you charge for something and will enough people be willing to pay for it and can enough people afford it, that's a real challenge. Um, other things we've been doing, uh, it's been hotly debated at council about bringing in um, toilets and charging 30p for toilets in the city. I think we've just about got to some political consensus that, um, that will, there'll be some charging for that. The charging for toilets, public toilets, will mean that we can um, roll out lots more, the capital costs of lots more toilets, which is a good thing. Um, so there are initiatives in many different places. Sometimes, oops, sometimes the business case stacks up and sometimes it doesn't. So um, we were talking earlier, uh, a couple of colleagues, about... Um, uh, what's happening at um, Stanmore Park. At Stanmore Park, we're going to be relocating some of the park services. Um, potentially, some of those park services will move to um, uh, Hangleton Bottom. A new facility will have to be built. And when we were looking at that, someone came up with the idea maybe we could move um, a centre for cats and dogs, um, a place where a cattery and a place where people can bring their dogs. And they looked at a business case to see if we built that facility would we be able to charge for a service and would it deliver enough income to pay for it? We did a lot of work around that. Ultimately, what we found, though, is that the business case didn't stack up. The capital cost of producing that building wasn't going to produce enough. We weren't going to be able to charge enough money to be able to make it stack up. So in the end, we tried it, had a look at it, decided the business case didn't stack up. It all went to members, all the information was there, decided not to do it. So you, you could say, well, that was a, wasn't that a waste of time, Jeff? Why did you do that? Sometimes we've just got to try and explore things and have a go at it, and that would be the case with trying to raise income. Uh, you, you sometimes got to give people the opportunity to explore something, work out, will it stack up? Will you get enough money in? And, and forgive them if it doesn't work out. Got two more, one there, one there. So, um, well, actually, our collections, if you look at where we collect money, so um, council rents, um, we've normally been hitting about 98% on council rents. Right. Um, I probably don't know all the... You might, it sounds to me you know more about that than I do. I mean, we might be writing some more... Right. 
Um, sounds like a good idea. Um, I don't know why we don't do that. So if you've got, if, if that sounds like to me it's something you know about, I would make a suggestion to do that. Um, I know sometimes we do write off some debt, uh, not necessarily about room hire, but we will have bad debt. So when uh, someone has defaulted on paying us for something, sometimes the cost of trying to recover that money will cost us more than the money we'll recover because you've got to go to court, you've got to pay solicitors and sometimes there's a judgment on that. But if there's a very specific thing about pay people paying up front, um, I think that can be, be brought to whatever area you're in. It's just whether... whether Okay, uh, I'll, I'll log it and um, I'll talk to um, David Koonsberg and others to see whether we can do something then. But um, yeah, keep pushing away at things like that. We are running out of funds for our service, which um, right. <laughs> Cash up front, like it. So I've got one person there, one person there, and one person there. Just to say it is four o'clock, so that's. Get through these I'm as okay quick as we can it, so whatever, how long some of us have to leave, stay? unfortunately. The so should we do those else. as the last four? Is that, can people hang on for that? Just really try, I'll try and be really quick. So there was this person there, one person here, one person there. Sorry if I've missed anyone. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's a really good question. Do people hear that about do, do we recover money from events? So there is an events team at the council, and we. Um, we do a lot of work to try and keep, as a visitor destination, to have events all the way through the year. So in the summer when it's school holidays and people are coming down, lots of people are coming down spending money. But really what you want is your tourism and visit trade to be running 365 days a year. You know, a cold day in February, you still want people coming to the city. So the events team is always trying to plan ahead. Now when, when they're looking at an event or someone approaches them like the marathon, they will seek to negotiate a price for allowing them to effectively run on our roads, run on our pavements, use Hove lawns. The ability of the event organisers to pay for it will depend on their revenue stream as well. Um, so we try and avoid situations where we're heavily subsidising something and we're trying to make every event pay for itself, including the cost of clean-up. And for example, Pride, we're going to be having a negotiation with Pride. At the moment, Pride uh, in Preston Park, they cover all the costs of the clean-up. Uh, in St. James's Street, the Pride Party, they cover all the clean-up of that. But certainly for city clean stuff, when you look at the rest of the city, I mean, it's an enormous clear-up. They make some contribution to us, but we're not sure at the moment that we're getting full cost recovery on that. So I think it's a really good question. There's a trade-off between having events happening in the city, helping businesses in the city from whom we collect business rates, and making sure that we're not overly subsidising, or if we can do, avoid any subsidy at all, and actually get an income. It, 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 would, need you, it would need a more detailed conversation with the events team to be able to explain where they make money and where they're offering subsidy. I hope, hope that goes some way to answering your question. A question here and then one there. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of organisations, probably one of the organisations which have set up in various box clusters, offering various services for children, not paying anything at all towards um, the uh, upkeep of those green spaces. And uh, the, the city is having to cover the cost of these businesses, which really is just taking you know, uh, liberties to do yeah.
boot camp. Uh, it's a really good point, I think, but you also partly answered the question as well when you talked about the politics. So, I mean, a couple of things. In uh, Preston Park, actually, the parking revenue from the sort of inner circle of the park, that, money's, that money is actually collected, and I think that does go to Preston Park's um, budget. And, and obviously, that more could be done like that. I think Stammer is an interesting one. The politicians get into some challenges sometimes about thinking what do they want to do in that space. Because obviously, the, at one level, we, we are custodians of assets for the community, particularly the parks, and many people will feel, well, I'm a community group, I want to do something in my locality, I haven't really got any money, I've just got volunteers. If the council appears to be charging me a lot, for a lot of money for doing that, or even any money, maybe I, you know, I can't afford to do it. So the politicians are often listening to the community and trying to weigh up, should we charge for that, not charge for that? I think where they're more obviously commercial operators and, and they are getting a, uh, an income stream, I think that's, I personally think it's a fair challenge, but I think it's a question ultimately that we've got to keep bringing back to the politicians because they are the ones who are setting the policy about can we charge or not. So it's definitely one they're considering um, and I think if there are ways in which we can um, get more sports clubs more people that are doing boot camps. Some of them have offered to, to give money for, for doing their, for running their businesses in our parks. Um, I, think, I think the opportunities are there, but the politicians are going to be making some very careful judgments about is that the right, is that what they want to say to local residents, local communities? So it's a tricky one. Last question. Um, can I give that question in writing? Because I don't know the answer to that. I'll give you a really pathetic answer. I just I don't I don't know the detail of it. I'm sorry, it's I, I just don't. But I'll try and find out for you. If you email me, I'll try and find out for you. So look, can I thank you all for um, giving your time up, you're all busy people, I really appreciate you coming and um, hope to see you again.